Hi everybody, Dr. Rob DiMartino here with Superior Health Solutions. And we wanted to make this DVD for you today talking about autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases is one of the most common things that we treat and take care of in our office. But I also find it's one of the more misunderstood things. And unfortunately, it's a condition that's actually typically, people are told that there's not a lot you can do about it, which, you know, I understand that from a, a medication standpoint, there's only so far that can go. But there's actually a lot that you can do with this. And I also find that a lot of people don't think that this is a real big deal. You know, it's like, oh, well, I have an autoimmune disease, no biggie. It's actually a huge problem. This is a disease. It's a chronic disease, and it's going to do damage. Cancer is a type of autoimmune disease. So we really wanted to take the time today to make this video. And the purpose of doing it, the goals, first we want to define terms. Obviously, we want to talk about what we're doing what each thing means, give you a layout of what this is actually causing and creating problems for. You know, obviously reviewing the basics of the immune system. Fortunately and unfortunately, our immune system works so well that we usually don't have to think about it. It does it on its own, but once it gets against us, then we have to know the basics of what it's doing. We want to go over what causes autoimmune disease. You know, there's this thought process out there that there's no known cause for it. Well, I'll tell you that there is known causes for it. It's different for each person, and it can be a combination of things, but for most chronic problems, it's typically assumed that, well, you know, there's no cause for them. The reality is there's no one cause for it. There's lots of different cofactors that come together and will it cause an autoimmune disease. And that's why it's a little bit crazy to think that we can treat each person with autoimmune disease the same way and have them get a result. This is not a syndrome. It's not as simple as A plus B equals C. There's more moving parts. That's what makes it complicated. But if you find all of those, you're in the game of talking about how you can get something like this better. And then, of course, talking about obvious different types of treatment options. And in this clinic, it's all about functional medicine. There's no drugs. There's no surgeries. That's kind of already proven not to be the way to go with these kind of disease processes. We've done it for a long time. Nothing is better. We need to talk about different treatment options that you can take back control of your health. So grab a pen and paper. This is important stuff. I'll try not to get too technical, but I want you to have the information so that you can make informed decisions when it comes to your health. So take notes. Feel free. Write down some questions. A little bit about me. I want this to be about you, but everyone always asks about me, so here's a little bit about me. I got my bachelor's of science degree from Hofstra University. I'm originally a New York guy. Um, then I went on to chiropractic school. I went to Palmer College of Chiropractic in Iowa, graduated 2005, uh, got my license in Nevada. A lot of what we're going to talk about today for autoimmune diseases doesn't relate to the chiropractic profession so much anymore. We're doing strict adjustments and things like that. I do practice a technique called quantum neurology. It's an advanced functional nerve technique. I'm a master trainer for the Neurologic Relief Centers. You'll see a lot of the things on our website and a lot of the videos that we'll put out will have to do with neurological problems, Parkinson's and the like. Uh, I am the former medical board chair for the Lupus Association of Nevada, a major, neurolo a major excuse me, autoimmune disease. I'm currently chairing the medical board for the Parkinson's Disease Association of Nevada. And our treatment technologies have been featured in three separate books talking about the unique way that we will go after things. Now I'm starting to teach these things nationally to doctors so that they can get the same kind of results that we get in our clinic for our patients. So enough about me. Let's go on to for, first and foremost talk about you and what you have going on. Autoimmune disease, the fastest growing epidemic in the country today. 188 disease classified now is autoimmune and we're adding more different ones now. Things like endometriosis, now considered an autoimmune problem. Autism, considered an autoimmune problem. It's fibromyalgia, not a primary autoimmune disease, but has secondary components as an autoimmune disease. 90% of all low thyroid cases are auto considered autoimmune, and they're not treated that way. They're typically not even found out that they're autoimmune. And this was research study done in 1998 by the Journal of Endocrinology, the journal when it comes to thyroid problems. This is not new information, it just hasn't caught up with the medical professions yet and we're not treating it the correct way. So, what autoimmunity is? What is it? Well, your immune system attacks itself. It attacks you on accident. It gets confused and then it begins to create an attacking mechanism against your own body which destroys and damages tissue. So, make no mistake about it, when you have an active autoimmune disease, 
your immune system will be destroying and damaging your tissue. So why did I say it's a big deal even though people come in and say oh, it's no big deal? It's a big deal from the inside out your body is destroying itself. Think of it like termites on the inside eating its way through. So we'll use uh, one of the analogies I use a lot of times in clinic is the idea of an allergy versus an autoimmune disease because I think this plays. So if you think about what an allergy is, all an allergy is is an abnormal immune system reaction to something that's normal, but it's outside of your body. So we'll use the idea of cats, right? You go around a cat, you get the allergic reaction. Your eyes itch, you get the scratchy throat, your runny nose, all that stuff. But then as soon as you move away from the cat, after a little bit of time of being away, you start to feel a little bit better, right? And, and cats are normal, you know, grass is normal, shellfish is normal. Allergies are reactions to normal things. Okay, so now let's compare that to autoimmune. All an autoimmune reaction is, is an abnormal immune system reaction to something that's normal, in this case your own body tissue, but it's internal. So the problem that we get is we never get separation from it, so your body will consistently attack. It never gets that distance to where it recognizes, oh wow, we shouldn't be doing this, which is why it doesn't stop. You know, earlier I talked about the fact that I have a degree in chiropractic, and I still do see chiropractic patients, but the reality of what we're talking about here is the reason I got into chiropractic was I loved the idea that the body could heal itself. And for somebody like me who I had chronic headaches as a kid between age 10 and 14, I had severe chronic migraines that basically ruined my life. And it was a chiropractor who helped get me out of that and basically saved my life. So in that world, I, I got into chiropractic because I loved that idea that the body could heal. But in autoimmune, one of the issues that we ran into when we were dealing with these types of patients was they weren't healing. Well, why not? Well, the problem is some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today, there's no separation. And that's where we get into this whole idea of there's an unknown cause, which we're going to talk about more. So how do you find this out? How do we diagnose these? Well, typically the way that we look at it is antibodies on blood work. Do you have antibodies showing that your body is attacking certain tissue? But I'll tell you, lots of times that's like searching for a needle in a haystack. You can look for, I mean, because there's lots of different tissues that your body can attack. Most of the times what I find when people say, well, this is not, my doctor said this is not autoimmune, they checked for lupus or rheumatoid, and those were the only two that they checked for, but they didn't check all the other tissues it could possibly affect. So we always look at immune system markers as well, too, to see, to look at immune system balance markers, which are typically not tests that are done, but they tell you whether or not there's something in your system that's making your, your immune system overreact, and not turn back off. So that's a problem. Now, the naming of autoimmune diseases is a huge deal because people say, well, I have this, I have that. Understand, all the name is, is it's identifying what tissue it's affecting. In multiple sclerosis, it's affecting the covering that's going around your nervous system. In lupus, it's affecting your connective tissues. In rheumatoid, it's affecting your joints. In Hashimoto's, it's affecting your thyroid. But at the end of the day, the culprit, the underlying factor that brings all of those guys together is your immune system is confused and attacking itself. We can work on trying to restore the function of the tissue, but as long as your immune system is attacking it, that function will never be there until the damage gets so great that we have to take some sort of crisis intervention. Okay, so here's the other problem. For 50% of the people, by the time that they find out that they have one active autoimmune disease going on in their body, there's already an active autoimmune reaction happening somewhere else, which means more than one tissue is being affected. It just may not be found on lab work. That's a huge problem because the other big issue with this here too is think about the concept of this doesn't always come with pain. You're, you're talking about cellular reactions. Your immune system is going every single day. It's cleaning up bacteria. It's taking out cells that aren't supposed to be there. This is something that's going without you feeling it. So most people don't start to have symptoms of an autoimmune disease until they actually have enough damage done to the tissue where it's so insurmountable now that they start to feel it. So the damage is catastrophic. Now we feel it. Now we have to work. Remember this. Prevention is not the same thing as early detection. Lots of times people find things early. Oh, I have this going on. Oh, my doctor is watching this. I'll get that a lot of times in clinic. But so what are you doing about it? Well, nothing. We're going to watch it. And then once it's bad enough, then we'll do something about it. Well, well that's not prevention at all. That's actually the opposite of prevention. You, you know it's there. You're just doing nothing about it until it's so bad. Now you have to take this kind of gross crisis reaction towards it. 
versus the earlier you know it's there, the faster you can start to get some of these things under wraps and you don't have to deal with it for long term. That's the true basis of prevention. They become synonymous terms, but they do not mean the same thing, obviously. So two parts of the immune system. Th1 system, okay, cell-mediated immunity. This is your attack side, okay? Your body's gonna go in, it's gonna kill bacteria, it's gonna kill virus, it's gonna kill anything that's not supposed to be there. Most autoimmune diseases are Th1 dominant, okay? Th2 is the humoral side. What Th2 does more of, it's about memory. So once you get an infection, once you get an allergy to something, your body's going to remember that it's there and then it's going to react in kind later on. So, oh, I had strep throat before, now I'm going to go after it, I'm going to, you know, I know how to handle it better this time. Okay, so Th2 dominance is basically more on the allergic reaction side. Asthmas, things like that will tend to be more Th2. Lupus can be more of a Th2 dominant problem as well. If one system becomes dominant over the other, that is autoimmune disease. The Th1, the killer side of your immune system, is completely dominant and it just keeps killing and killing and killing until accidentally it starts killing some of your own tissue. The imbalance between the two immune systems is what causes an autoimmune reaction. So that's, again, I hear this all the time, Dr. D, I don't get sick. I don't, I don't get it. How can I have an autoimmune disease? I never get sick. Most autoimmune reactions are Th1 dominant. Okay. So if you have that patient, you have that Th1 dominance. In the Th1 dominance, your system is overreacting. It's killing everything. So yeah, most of the time, you're not going to get sick because not only is it killing every bacteria and virus that's in your system, but it's killing your own tissue. So there is that overreaction. That's why people will get confused. Well, if I had autoimmune problems, if I have an immune system issue, aren't I going to get sick? No. Now, eventually, once you wear out your Th1 system and you start slipping over, now eventually, it's like army people. You don't have enough troops to send in anymore. Now your system is going to get weakened and now you're going to start getting sick more often. That's why all cancers, pretty much all cancers, are Th2 dominant. So that's why we never like to let the system go because you, you can't rev and rev and rev. You can't just kill and kill and kill and be overactive all the time. Eventually you will exhaust the system and once they go Th2 dominant, which is why you see so much cancer in lupus patients later on, is because all cancers now sit in an immune system that's compromised. Cancers are Th2 dominant. This is a, again, it goes back, this is a big problem. Cancer is an autoimmune disease, essentially. You have to deal with it like it's a huge problem. Immune balance is critical, obviously, for long-term sustained health. You, know, you can't have, in the medical world, the reaction to treating this is to suppress your immune system. They're going to give you medications that are going to lower your immune system response. And okay, that's fine for the short term. I've had people in crisis and it's a dangerous thing and in that moment they need to get it under control. I'm okay with that. That makes a lot of sense to me. But for a long-term methodology, you cannot suppress your immune system forever. You need your immune system on your side. It's what's going to keep you healthy and eventually keep you out of having cancer. So lots of times people tell you, know, are, are there hints? Are there things that you, I could tell without lab work? You know, I did lab work. Doctor says everything is normal. By the way, if your doctor tells you everything is normal on labs, but you didn't see the labs, always make a point to request the labs because usually you will find lab work that's high or low, but it's, again, not quite bad enough for them to worry about it. You need to know those numbers and you need to operate within functional ranges. With labs, it's really important. There's these big numbers that they give you. You need to be between, you know, 30 and 200 to be okay. That's fine, but there's a fine line in there where it's optimum. Especially if you already have one of these problems going on, you need it to be optimum in order to heal. You want to be optimum anyways, but especially in that markers. So those are important ideas with labs. But things like this, I got sick after I, I got, I had all these problems after an illness. I got a virus and then all of a sudden I stopped sleeping and I can't sleep anymore. Everything went bad after I got just a common cold. Because that turns the immune system on and if it's already imbalanced, it's going to create more of an imbalance. Problems persist after you take tons of supplements. I have patients come in and they have a supplement list as long as my arm. And I use supplements, I do, but I don't use a tremendous amount of them for purposes that we'll get into later. But supplements are important, but people are taking them and they're, you know, they get the honeymoon phase, what I call it. They feel a little bit better for a little while and then they kind of go right back to where they were. Good sign that there's some kind of autoimmunity. They go from doctor to doctor. I think right now my record was I was the 34th doctor somebody came to see before we solved their issue. So, you know, you're bouncing back and forth. We want to eliminate all of that. You need to be able to look at this as a whole. Lots of times, these are way more common in women. So lots of times it'll show up after a pregnancy 
Well, why? Because it doesn't even, if you're TH1 dominant, that absolutely stops if you get pregnant. Because no matter what's happening in your body as a mom, your body will protect that baby. So there won't be an immune system reaction as long as the baby's in jeopardy. So it actually stops that. So so many women come in here and they say, you know, I felt the best I ever felt when I was pregnant. Or I was fine when I was pregnant, then after the pregnancy ended like six weeks after, I didn't feel good again, or the problem started. That's because right after about that six week mark is when the system will start to go back and that dominance will kick back in. Estrogens will provoke autoimmune diseases. So anytime there's a change around cycle time, anytime that there's a change when somebody moves into menopause, those are good telltale signs that somebody's got an immunity issue going on. If the problems are unexplainable, you have this unknown problem, unknown disease. If there's something that we can't figure out what's driving it when somebody comes in here, nine times out of ten it's an autoimmune reaction that just didn't get noticed. Okay. So again, we talked a little bit about this as far as the approach of how you want to go doing it. But the reality of it is, is we can't suppress the immune system forever. You need to have other options to be able to deal with it so that this doesn't become a long-term chronic problem. Suppression is fine in the front end, but you can't do it forever, otherwise you're just going to end up with other problems. Okay, you need your immune system. So, okay, so what's the cause? Right, we spent all this time talking about what it is, hopefully you understand your immune system's out of balance. What's the cause? Well, basically, something gets into your immune system, into your body that your immune system doesn't recognize. It doesn't recognize it. It's either too big to kill. It's an inanimate object. It's in a place where it can't get to it. Something causes confusion or an overreaction of the immune system. And that sounds pretty logical, but that's basically what it is. Something gets in there. You have to identify what that is, and it's going to be different for everybody, and then get that out. Because if you don't, without removal of the source of what's driving the immune system reaction to begin with, the body will never stop. So here are your basic culprits, okay? Toxins, infections, food allergies, leaky gut, hormones, and genetics. It's a pretty small list, and again, we're kind of oversimplifying for the case here of not making this too complicated, because there's a lot that goes into all of this. But the reality of it is, is these are the things that are going to drive that reaction. If something toxic gets into your system, your body's going to react to it. And unfortunately, we live in a polluted world and it's not getting any better, it's getting worse. And you know, a lot of that comes with the great technology. I mean, look, we're, we're watching a DVD from a video or maybe you're watching this on the internet. That's a great thing, but it comes with a cost. You know, hormones are very different now. People are using hormone replacement therapies constantly. Infections are becoming a huge thing. We'll get into all of these individually, but these are your major culprits of where you are. So let's talk about toxins. Pretty much unavoidable. And, but we have this idea that toxins are something that happens in the environment and it doesn't necessarily affect us. But it does. They will get into our body. Now sure, our body has systems that be able to deal with toxic overload. We have our liver, we have our kidneys. But they were not designed to handle the amount of burden that we put on them right now. You have to understand, right now we're pumping about 90,000 different chemicals into the air. And of those, we're not really even sure if a lot of them are safe. Many of them haven't been tested. So we're not really sure exactly what's happening. You know, we're in Vegas, it's a lot more of a crowded area in the city. But it doesn't mean that there's not other problems elsewhere. You know, there's all this different, they're pumping two tons of different types of chemicals into our water system. In food, you know, there's 10,000 different chemicals that we add to processed foods now. And then you have to add other chemicals to hold those chemicals in. There's a chemical onslaught that's happening to all of us. And some of it is, is necessary and some of it is not. But those are the things that you need to be aware of that at this point, detoxification, helping your body get that stuff out, has got to become a necessity. So let's talk about some of the places. Heavy metals are a huge one. They're probably going to go down becoming the epidemic of our time. And you probably heard about a lot of this, but again, it's this concept of, well, that can't get inside of my body, but probably going to tell you easily 60% of the people who walk into this clinic, no matter what they have going on, we find heavy metals in their system that are coming out of their system unbound, undetoxified, which if it gets out into your urine that way, it's going to be damaging your liver and your kidneys for sure. Six out of ten people are going to come out with that. Then if we look deeper, we typically find it even more than that. This is a huge problem. So where does it come from? Well, mercury is the one that gets all the publicity, so where does mercury come from? Well, I know there's all this hype about dental fillings, but it's a big deal. They call them silver, but they're almost 50% mercury. And they will leak out and they will leach and they will start to put off vapors into your system. 
they will make people sick, unfortunately. I hate to be the one to burst the bubble with that one. Fish. If we lived in California, everywhere that served fish, there's a placard on the wall that says, be understood, if you eat fish, you have a chance of getting mercury poisoning from it. Vaccinations, especially the flu vaccine. There's a lot of mercury in flu vaccines. There's 25 grams of ethyl mercury, the type that goes directly to your brain in flu vaccines. It's a large amount of something that's poisonous. Not to even mention this, up until the mid-90s, 1995, they used to put pure mercury in contact lens solution. So not only was it the pure mercury type that would go to your brain, but you would actually put it right into your eyeball so it would go have a direct pathway right to that. Now, if you look at most contact lens solutions, it says it does not contain mercury. But for most people, they were dumping it into their eyes on a daily basis, unfortunately. Lead, lead stores in bone, okay? So after a pregnancy is when the person will lose the most amount of bone. That's a huge issue. And again, part of why we talked about earlier of why I, I got really sick after the pregnancy, Lead dumps out of your system like that. It's actually probably the most common reason why people will have secondary infertility, why they get pregnant with one child and then they can't have one after that fact. Large lead levels. 20 of 33 major lipsticks that they tested contained lead. Again, much more common in women. One of the major reasons why is this idea of cosmetics. Okay, huge problems that we see. Study in the Journal of, of Environmental Health found that women between the ages of 65 and 87 with high lead levels were 60%, 60, that's 60%, more likely to die during the 12-year study. Okay, this stuff screws up the way your system works. It won't kill you in the moment, thank goodness, but it screws up the way your system works. Okay. The, the International Academy of Oral Medicine Toxology is a great resource, and, and I, I encourage you to go on their YouTube, and if you just search IAOMT smoking teeth, they'll show you tests that they ran on mercury fillings, and something is simple enough of the amount of vapor that it gives off, and then if you eat, which they mimic by using an eraser of a pencil, it just dumps a tremendous amount of this gas back into your body, and mercury is probably the second most toxic thing on Earth to humans, except for plutonium, which is what they put in nuclear fallout to kill the most amount of people. But we're walking around with these things all jammed in our mouths. Uh, think of it this way. When they put mercury into your mouth, it has to show up in a biohazard container. It has to be taken out with special precautions. It has to be in a room that's got a vent system. It's got to have a certain oxygen content. They have to be all messed up, the doctors and the nurses. And it's completely biotoxic until, for whatever reason, when you put it into your mouth, it stops being biotoxic. Because the second they take those out and they go to remove them, they can't just throw them in the trash, they have to put them back into a biohazard container and dispose of them like biohazards. So I don't know what the difference is once it breaches your mouth of why it becomes hazardous then, but it doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. Forget all the science, just thinking logically. Okay, moving on. Nickel, really common in Nevada. Very high levels of nickel concentration in our soil. We absolutely know that nickel causes weird neurological, weird cancers in humans and definitely autoimmune problems. Also very common to be found for people who have breast implants. So leaching out of the fluid in between there can cause a problem with autoimmunity. Cadmium, very common in people who smoke or around secondhand smoke, but it's also used as a pesticide on our foods. So cadmium is a very common metal that we find, probably one of the more common metals that we find, but the downside with cadmium is if they have cadmium, they probably have others. Aluminum, look no further than your bathroom. The deodorant that you're using, the shaving cream that you're using, most of the active ingredients in those things are aluminum. And when you mix aluminum with fluoride, which is in our water source, it goes right to your brain and creates an instant chemical reaction. You mix the smallest amount of aluminum that probably would be harmful for you with the smallest amount of mercury and you'll get a hundred times the effect. It'll be like setting off an atom bomb inside of your body. All of these things. By the time you leave your bathroom after getting washed up in the morning, you've probably been exposed to more chemicals in that few minute period of time than what our ancestors were in the course of their entire year of their lifetime. Again, xenobiotics, a special classification where we talk about for chemicals that are found in the environment. Again, cosmetics are a huge one. Plastics for, plastics for, again, women are really more common with this. Pesticides. Pesticides, there's 11 different pesticides that have been pointed out in the etiology, the causation of Parkinson's disease. This is documented scientific, non-third-party research. 
And this is just something that we're not hearing about. You have to be able to identify and get these things out because if your immune system sees it, it's not going to know what it is. EM fields, the Wi-Fi, the cell phones, the, you know, the power lines that we all live underneath. Think about it this way. If you have heavy metals in your system and we put a magnetic field on them, it's going to increase the activity of those metals. That makes people sick. When they get around fields, it makes them not feel well. It makes them sick. It drives this reaction. So again, real tough to get away from EM fields, but there are things that you can do to protect yourself. Especially in your bedroom at night when you sleep, move your clock radio away from where you sleep. Don't sleep with your cell phone right next to your head. I mean, I think even I'm guilty of that one sometimes. Uh, I tend to be reading on my phone and fall asleep with it on me. But the reality of it is, is there are things that we can do to be protective of this stuff if we know that it's there and we're taking proper precautions. Okay. You got to be careful about supplements and the quality of supplements. You know, I watch people sometimes, I go to stores and, and I'll watch people just dumping supplements into their carts that are just poor quality. They're not going to absorb and they're probably going to create them more harm than good. For example, when people take vitamin C, lots of times vitamin C will show up as ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is not natural vitamin C, it's synthetic vitamin C. And it's actually been proven to destroy the good bacteria in your stomach. So despite the fact of some of the good things that maybe even that synthetic vitamin C will provide for you, it will create a secondary problem. And we'll talk about here shortly how important your gut and your stomach is when it comes to immunity issues. you got to make sure that you're using things. Now for all of the supplement lines that we use in the office, we make sure that they're excipient free. There's no chemicals, there's no process, there's nothing else in there. That's something we wanted to do for our patients to hold it to that standard. But that doesn't mean you can't use your own supplements. You just have to make sure that they're of the highest quality. Again, so fillers, if you look at supplements outside of the United States, they're tiny. You know, they're, they're, they're teeny, teeny, tiny little pills. Meanwhile, we take these gigantic horse pills. Well, why is that? Well, we have the concept here, bigger is better and more is better. So they make these giant things. And mostly if it's just filler, that actually doesn't end up helping you. It ends up hurting you. Okay. Enriched foods, in, when they use that word enriched, that means that there's iron ore. That the iron that they're using to enrich with iron, that's iron ore. That's not naturally occurring iron that your body will use to help oxygenate your red blood cells. That's iron ore. That stuff deposits. You find it in Lou Gehrig's disease. You find it in Parkinson's. You find it in MS. You find it in autism. You find that these people have iron ore deposits in the brain when they do autopsy after the fact. Be careful of enriched foods. Things like natural flavoring. Natural flavoring is a nice way of saying MSG. But now there's like 65 different names that they use for MSG because everyone caught on that MSG wasn't good for you. This stuff still gets into our food source, which is why diet is such a foundational thing with this. Your body only knows how to do one thing. It's attack. It's to protect you. So it's going to turn on. It's going to get into attack mode. But what if something gets into your body that can't be killed? So what if a piece of mercury breaks off a filling and it gets into your system and your immune system looks and says, what's that? I don't know what that is. Well, all we know is it's not supposed to be there, so attack it and kill it off. So it attacks it like it's bacteria, something foreign. But it can't kill it because you can't kill a piece of mercury, it's an admin. You can't kill plastic, it's an admin. So does your immune system say, well, just, just leave it there? No, it, it's, it, it's uh, try harder, try harder, keep fighting, keep attacking, keep attacking it will keep driving this reaction. Wherever that mercury lands, that tissue will then start to eventually get hit by friendly fire. So if the mercury gets involved in your thyroid, you know, moves from your tooth right down and gets lodged in the thyroid gland, which is really common, eventually your thyroid tissue starts to get damaged in the process. It won't give up, but basically it's friendly fire. It will just keep attacking. So. For hopefully, you know, we, we could spend all day just going over all of the different toxins. Just know that toxic chemicals are a huge function of this. They get into our systems and without proper detoxification, you have to get all that stuff out. Now, maybe you're saying, well, I did some detox before. You know, I've, I've done that. You know, I've, I've put myself through a program. This has to be done really correctly and really specifically. Otherwise, you can actually end up causing more problem than it's worth. But if you do it the right way, it will pay huge dividends for now and in the long term. So, Infections, what we'll call low-level stealth infections that get into your system. You always hear them talking about the fact that there's going to be this mega virus or the newest flu or whatever that's going to kill us all, or some sort of antibiotic-resistant strain 
of a bacteria that's going to kill us all. And the reality of it is, is that's already starting to happen on some level. We're starting to get viruses and bacteria into the body that your system doesn't recognize, that even your immune system can't kill off. And they hide in places where you, or you can't get to it, like root canals. Old root canals are a perfect place for this. They'll get deep in there, your immune system can't get into them. And all root canals basically have some sort of non-oxygen using bacteria in there. Strep, staph is really common. MRSA, you know, medication resistant staph aureus in this country, kills more people than Parkinson's. And we're not talking about it. Again, the use of antibiotics is a major player in this. We're going to use this term, and you'll hear me use it many times. It's called cell wall deficient bacteria. Cell wall deficient bacteria create chaos, and this is why. What makes our cells different than any other cell, a bacteria or a virus, is our cells have a membrane around the outside of them. Bacteria have a wall, a protein wall, and in that protein wall, it's coded as to what that is. So if your white blood cells bump into it, it says, oh, it's a protein wall. It plugs in just like a computer, and it says, oh, this is staph or this is strep, or this is mono, or whatever. Then your immune system comes in, the cavalry comes, kills it off, and everyone moves forward. Antibiotics don't do that. See, white blood cells will come in, and they'll grab it, and they'll engulf it, and they'll swallow it up whole so it's gone. Antibiotics don't do that. Antibiotics are like a missile. So what they do is they come firing in, and they slice right through the bacteria. So it would be like an analogy, again, is me taking a vase that I don't glass vase that I don't want anymore and smashing it on the ground. I don't have the whole vase anymore, but there's probably lots of shards of glass on the floor. Some of them are even too small for me to see. Now that protein wall is damaged. So we have a cell wall deficient bacteria. So now your immune system looks and goes, what is that? Tries to plug in and can't tell what it is. So it doesn't know how to attack it. It goes in and binds with a certain tissue. Maybe it gets inside of a cell. Next thing you know, your immune system is in is in chaos. It, it doesn't know what it is, it gets confused, and that's the hallmark for what starts autoimmunity. So you think, well, you know, I mean, most people have taken antibiotics at some point over the course of their lifetime, and maybe it was probably necessary when you did. But the reality of it is this, is think about that 80% of the antibiotics that get produced are in our food, that they're giving it to the animals and stuff that we're eating. That's where most of the antibiotics are actually coming from. So it's not just, well, I took a course of antibiotics when I had a cold, you know, a few years ago, but that's all I really do. No, you're pretty much taking them every single day, especially if you're eating beef that's not organic or grass-fed and things like that. They're using it in those kinds of products, so you're getting a dose of antibiotics every single day. Scary stuff, but it is the truth. So, again, talk about the antibiotics in our food. So if the liver is overwhelmed by all the toxins it must deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, the infections are going to spill back into your bloodstream. And once they get back into your bloodstream, it goes systemic, and your immune system has to get up and get involved and get engaged. Infections, low-level infections. Cell wall deficient bacteria is not even very much a United States concept. You hear a lot of doctors outside of the States, Germany, Swiss, they're light years ahead of us, talking about these kind of concepts. There are no labs in the U.S. that we've been able to find that actually test and look for cell wall deficiency bacteria, even though it's a very common thing for them to test for in Germany. But they've identified lots of different types. For example, in multiple sclerosis, there's a certain type of cell wall deficient bacteria that will rise, meaning it will start to give off biotoxins, and biotoxins is what makes us not feel well. It will rise the biotoxin level, and that's what actually will cause an MS person to regress. Common knowledge in Germany, don't hear anybody talking about it here, but if we handle the biotoxins coming off of that cell wall deficient bacteria, you severely increase your chance of getting an MS patient to not have a regression, which is huge. You know, and then in the world of autoimmunity, if you get nothing else done but keep them from going backwards, it's a huge win because they're, the disease is going to progress and get consistently worse. If you can put it into remission or, you know, good Lord willing, you can reverse it, that's a great thing to have happen. But it's a huge finding for MS that nobody is talking about. Huge deal. You can certainly test for it and, and treat, it, treat it in a specific way. Okay, so let's talk about the concept of food allergies. Food allergies is kind of a misnomer. What we really want to say is sensitivity. Again, I used the analogy earlier about uh, um, allergies with a cat. I'm not talking about the runny nose, the itchy eyes, the scratchy. I'm talking about foods that, for whatever reason, make our bodies inflame. And it can inflame up to four days after you've eaten it. So you don't have to feel it the second you eat it. You don't have to even feel it within a couple of hours of eating it. It could be three, four days later. But that will cause the body to cause inflammation. Inflammation is going to be found in every major disease and especially in autoimmunity, but it causes this whole body systemic react. 
Here's the trick. Foods that you're sensitive to don't have to be unhealthy. I had a thyroid case once and she was Hashimoto's and the case responded beautifully to care but she kept having little reflare-ups and I kept telling her you're eating something you're sensitive to but her diet was very clean. Well when we finally ran a food sensitivity, not an allergy panel, but a food sensitivity panel, they're different. When we ran one of those, we found out that she was massively having an inflammatory reaction to asparagus, of all things, randomly. Once she took the asparagus out of her diet, she was great, did much better. Lots of people have little things like that, and sometimes they could be healthy foods, and lots of times it's stuff that they like, but it can be causing their problem, and you don't know unless you look or test there, but people will get lulled into the sense of security, well, asparagus is good for you. Yeah, it's good for you, but it's not good for you. Unfortunately, when you're playing on this kind of level, in order to get the kind of results that we're talking about, getting somebody better, remission, reversed, the details are that much are important. If you don't break it down to that kind of level, you're not going to get very far. Leaky gut, okay? Standard American diet is the perfect prescription to give somebody leaky gut. You probably heard about leaky gut on the internet or somewhere along those lines. Basically what it means is the food that we eat and swallow is meant to be quarantined in our stomach. There's meant to have no interaction with the rest of our body. But leaky gut means that the lining of your stomach has been damaged. Now again, processed food, sugars, all of the chemical junk that we eat on a day-to-day -day basis, heavy metals for sure, will perforate right through that gut lining and then that's where the concept of leaky gut comes from. Whole food particles will make it into your bloodstream. That causes this systemic immune system reaction to what's going on. Now again, every time we eat, we're provoking our immune system causing a systemic you know, autoimmune reaction or immune reaction which eventually goes against us. That's a huge problem. When you think about how many times you eat and every time you do it, you're basically poking the bear of your immune system that's already attacking your body. Huge problem. Especially when you consider the fact that 80% of autoimmunity, of, of all your immune system regulation occurs in your gut. So yeah, on that idea, the, the gut is a huge battlefront where the, the fight for autoimmunity begins because if we don't have good healthy gut function, you, you find autoimmune patients that do, but it's rare. Most of them don't have good, and it can be small things. I, mean, I have reflux, I get gassy burping, you know, bloaty sometimes, you know, nothing too major. Reflux is really common. Something you got to handle. Taking a med for it's not going to solve the issue. You got to handle that in order to restore, you know, lying to the gut. Here's another tip. If you're pumping probiotics, okay, we talk about food not wanting to get out of your gut lining and getting into your bloodstream, but if you're pumping probiotics into your system and your gut's leaking, that's bacteria, even though it's good bacteria, but that good bacteria is meant to stay quarantined in your stomach as well. If that good bacteria morphs out and gets into your blood system, it's going to change over and it's going to start causing you more harm than good. It's going to cause your immune system to react to bacteria spilling into your blood system. So be cautious about this constant use of probiotics. Probiotics are great. There is a time and place to use them. We absolutely use them in the office. But the constant use of them, especially if leaky gut is there, will actually again cause you more harm than good, especially if you have an autoimmune disease. It's one of those places where again the devil lies in the details. So, you know, again, we're talking about major, major stuff here. 80% of the immune system regulation, you know, the gut is an important factor. We always end up working to clean up the diet, clean up the gut. Make sure it's rebuilt. Make sure you re inoculate it with good bacteria, but the gut has to be well in order for us to move forward. Okay, let's talk about hormones. Toxic hormones, toxic estrogens are huge players in this. And with the rapid use of birth control, lots of women taking hormones and bioidentical hormones and things like that, you know, you, you see this becomes a huge problem for us. So, toxic estrogens drive autoimmunity. We talked about that earlier. So, again, well, why does it get worse when my cycle hits? Or why does you know why do I not feel well? Or the week before my cycle is terrible, and the first two days I'm down for the count, and I sort of kind of feel better. But I just talked to a patient the other day, and she told me basically three weeks out of the month are horrible. Because the week before her cycle is terrible, then the week while she's on her cycle is terrible, and then the week after that she's like recovering, and then the week after that she's okay, and then she starts the whole process all over again. She's a massive autoimmune issue that nobody solved for her. We already found. And that's why she was dealing with all the issues. Birth controls, xenoestrogens, xenoestrogens like xenobiotics, talking about stuff that mimics, you know, toxic chemicals that mimic something in your body, it mimics estrogens. The, pla the BPA from plastics, you hear about it all the time. The cheap water bottles, the drinking water that we use, those really cheap plastic bottles, 
That's why when you get some of these higher end brands, they got that really heavy duty, thick pharmaceutical plastic. Like if you took and you hit somebody over the head with it, you knock them out cold. But that won't leach the BPA. It's why you see so many places selling water uh, bottles that are glass. Because the BPA creates all this hormone dysregulation inside somebody. The, these aren't complicated fixes. You just have to know to fix them and to make the changes. So let's talk about genetics because a lot of confusion here. When we say genetics, we mean something different than what they meant in the past. In the past, we used to say, well, my mom had diabetes, so I was destined to get di diabetes. And, and there's a percentage of the population, about 5% of the population, that's actually true for. But the majority, 95%, the vast, vast, vast majority of genetic issues that we find are genes that will turn themselves on or off. So people ask me all the time, it's like, I, I was fine. Why did this all of a sudden happen? You did enough damage, enough bad stuff got in your body, there was enough reaction, enough inflammation to turn on a bad gene. And this is also consistent for the concept of like the, the, the breast cancer gene and all of those things as well. And you know, this is by no means any kind of commentary on Angelina Jolie because she did the best she did with what the information that she was given. But the reality is something in her system was expressing that genetic. Something was causing her body to turn that gene on. Yeah, sure, she was predisposed because mom had the gene, probably. But it doesn't necessarily mean that if she didn't do some other things, that she may have been able to turn that genetic off. Don't know, didn't see her case. Again, certainly nothing against her. But these are the concepts that we have to start changing what we're talking about because the, the science is already there, but the way we're practicing around it as doctors isn't, which is crazy. We haven't caught up yet in one of these cases. So all of a sudden, I just I started not feeling well. That gene finally turned on. Early 2000, they did the human genome study, and what they found is a whole other science called epigenetics. Epigenetics literally means above the genome, not your DNA, because you can't change that, but you can change things above those levels, things that will turn on and off. So for instance, the MTHFR is a really common genetic problem that we find in people, epigenetic change that we find in people who have autoimmune diseases. They can be up to 70% unavailable to create B vitamins. That affects a whole series. B vitamins, I mean, you look online, there's nothing that B vitamins don't do in your body. But that's a massive problem for somebody if they can't absorb B vitamins. And then now again, they're taking all of these synthetic B vitamins and they can't use it. It makes the problem worse. Important to know. I actually have that genetic. My mom has it, gave it on to me. So that was passed down through my gene lines. The HLA, DR, anybody who gets around mold who has that genetic will instantly become sick. And right now, we're thinking it's about 23% of the population. So that's one out of every four people will have a massive immune system reaction if they get around mold. There's ways to test for this. The APOE gene, again, a lot of people have to know it has to do with cholesterol. It's also been pointed out in Alzheimer's. But basically, with that genetic, you'll have a very difficult time getting heavy metals out of your central nervous system. Important stuff to know when you're dealing with somebody. What always got me was I, I could never understand how everyone I saw got the same treatment. You know, I use Parkinson's for an example. Every Parkinson's patient that I see comes in on taking the same exact medication. But they all have different symptoms. Some of them shake, some of them don't. You know, some of them have difficulty walking, some of them don't. Some of them have speech issues, some of them don't. So you have all of these people with totally different presentations of the disease and different stages of the disease, who's had it for 12 years, who's just newly diagnosed. You have different lifestyles, different foods, different histories, different genetics, but every single person gets the exact same treatment. And then we wonder why here we are all these years later and we're into a, you know, over a billion dollars in clinical drug trials, but are we any further with getting Parkinson's better than we were before? Not really. It's got to be individual. This has to be stripped down to this level. I understand doctors are usually behind and they may not have the chance to do all this stuff, but if you want to get those types of results, that's one of the ways that it has to happen. So how do you turn these, these genes that are on that are bad turn back off? Well, that's done by a chemical in your body called methyl groups. Okay, methyl groups, really simple. Carbons and hydrogen, not to get too complicated, but they're the most common elements that you see around. But these guys run over 300 different processes in your body. One of them is to keep inflammation down. A lot of them is revolving with, with histamine reactions, so allergic reactions when you get out. A lot of it has to do with the utilization of B vitamins. A lot of it has to do with the turning off and detoxifying of toxic estrogens. Somewhere down this whole list at the bottom of methyl groups, if you don't use them all up, which most people are deficient in them because they're, they're involved in the detoxification of our bodies, 
is where it will turn off these genes. But nobody ever gets close to that point because there's so much chemical toxicity out there. You use all your methyl groups up trying to detoxify all the heavy metals in your systems and all the toxic estrogens and all the plastics and everything else like that. And there's none left over to activate the B vitamins. There's none left over to activate the neurotransmitters and that's why you get depressions and anxieties. There's none left over to repair your DNA. There's none left over to change and shut off those genetics. It's a really big thing. If you did nothing else for yourself but restore methylation, the process of, of donating methyl groups, your health would take a significant turn for the positive. But it's not something, again, no medication that does it. It's not something that's typically talked about. You need B vitamins. You need sulfur. You need appropriate trace minerals in order to do that. Again, some people have genetics where they can't absorb B vitamins, but you also need proper stomach acid. And we just talked about the fact that for pretty much 99 out of 100 autoimmune patients that we see, they're going to have leaky gut, which means their, their acid levels aren't going to be appropriate. And if their acid levels aren't appropriate, they won't create methyl groups. So now do you see how we're creating this vicious cycle that just keeps repeating itself? You can't, the genes are on, you can't turn them off. The gut gets worse, the genes stay on, can't turn them off, gut gets worse, more spills out, more reaction. And we're in a loop that's feeding itself. I talked about earlier that I love the idea that the body could heal itself. It's why I got into doing it this way. My sort of existential crisis, if you will, came from where, well, okay, so why isn't it healing for these types of cases? Why aren't they healing? Well, the answer to that, in short, is the body's stuck in a negative loop and it can't get itself out. It thinks it's protecting itself and now it doesn't have the materials and tools it needs to get out of it. If you give it those tools, it knows what to do. It's good stuff. Okay, so when we talk about pathological detox, made mention of it earlier. If you're doing detoxification, like things with methylation and things like that, if you can't methylate and you go through a standard detox program that you may buy over the counter in a store, it'll actually cause you more harm than good because you'll put so many extra things in your system as your body pulls out all of this stuff. If it can't get it out, or if it can't properly break it down to make it where it's not going to be a problem for you, you're going to end up with more toxic load, which is why you see people get so sick when they do detoxification programs. I have patients come out and say, Doc, I don't want to do, I don't want any part of detox. I got so sick the last time I did that. It's a pretty good sign that they didn't set the stage. You need to make sure your liver can handle it. You need to make sure your kidneys can handle it. You need to make sure that you're methylating properly. You need to make sure that all of those things are happening so that once you do detox, it's going to be safe, number one, but you're going to get the effect that you want out of it, not create a furthering of problem. So, you know, again, always be careful with that. Have somebody run it for you. Have a doctor. Have somebody check it out and know what they're doing. Okay, so now let's go back to the beginning. We have all this stuff going on. We've got all these chemical toxins in our system. We've got infections laboring in our system. We've got toxic estrogens. We've got hormone change. We've got all this crazy, you know, the gut's leaking and damaged. All this stuff is going on. What happens when we give somebody a pill long term to suppress any chance that the body has of fighting against that? In the long term, you're going to speed up this issue. You're going to speed up the damage that's done. You're going to suppress it, but eventually now your body can't protect itself anyway. And this is never, hopefully by this point you understand that that's never going to get you to a point of where you can have a conversation of, you know, even a remission, let alone a resolution of this issue which is why, unfortunately. You know, people ask me all the time, well, how do you get results you know, where nobody else does? Well, I don't operate purely pharmaceutically. I don't just do the same drug for everyone who walks into my office. I have all these other things, and we'll talk about some of them coming up here, at my disposal that allows me to work outside of the box a little bit. So outside of that box is unfortunately where the answers to all these things lie. So, in chronic inflammation, every disease process, it doesn't matter if it's neurological, it doesn't matter if it's autoimmune, it doesn't matter what, every one of these problems has chronic inflammation. That's actually one thing that pretty much everyone in medical agrees upon. But you have to also remember, inflammation is not a cause. Something causes your body to inflame. That's the ultimate point of leverage. You know, if you get an infection in the tissue, that's going to cause some tissue damage. That's going to create an inflammation. You'll see that go up on blood markers. Okay, well, we can get the blood markers lower, but if the infection is still there, the tissue will just constantly inflame and we're going to tread water at best. And we don't want to do that. We want to move forward. So chemicals use, uh, your body uses chemical markers called cytokines to drive the reaction. Some cytokines are TH1 dominant, some cytokines are TH2 dominant, it's the two parts of your immune system. Short term, these cytokines are really good. They will clean up your immune system, they'll help modulate your, and regulate your immune system, they'll, they'll clean up any infections in your system. 
again, if, it, if it, all these problems that we just spent all this time talking about, the toxins, the infections that can't kill, all that sorts of stuff gets in your system, they'll start to stay high, and these are the guys that create problems in your system and, and does the, ultimately does the damage. So just to go over a couple of them, TNF-alpha, tumor, tum, tumor necrosis factor alpha, okay? It's a really potent immune modulator. It's found in rheumatoid, ankylosing spondylitis, inflammatory bowel disease, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, all kinds of different cancers, diseases, multiple sclerosis, depression. In 2007, the NCIB, the higher levels are directly correlated with mortality. Okay? Pretty much the who's who of, of diseases, right? That's a high level. That's going to show up with people who have a Th1 dominant system. That's what's going to be happening in your body. That level is going to be high, and all of those things become possibilities. Interleukin 1, very inflammatory, does tissue damage. It has been known to cause sight loss and hearing loss because the inflammation levels get so high and organ shutdown. Important. Again, it breaks down the BBB, stands for blood brain barrier. Okay, it's the barrier that strains your blood between your brain and kind of picks and chooses who it gets through. It raises MMP, which is a specific chemical that basically mushes your body up from the inside out. Bad place for that to be high. Again, it's shown in all autoimmune diseases, all neurodegenerative diseases, lymphomas, multiple myelomas, and nasty cancer, type 2 diabetics, and cardiovascular disease. Again, the who's who list. Not the bludgeonies. Interleukin-6 raises your C-reactive protein levels. Maybe the one inflammatory marker that they did check for you on blood work. Maybe. Lymphocytic leukemia, anemia, liver damage, destroys your immune system cells, COPD. It's associated 98% of the time, it's with very low DHEA. That causes sleep apnea. Okay, so again, another problem that we see quite often, but it's one of the things we have to look for deeper. Interleukin-8 inhibits antiviral activity, liver disease, bladder cancer, kidney disease, prostatitis, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, pulmonary infections. Again, I, I put these up here, you don't have to memorize them or know them even for the fact. I just want you to understand that these are the chemicals that go high when somebody has an autoimmune disease. So again, hopefully this is kind of getting that information out there that holy cow, this can move into stuff that's really not good and bad. This is why we call it a disease process. They're, and their cytokines are very difficult markers, or they used to be, I should say, very difficult markers to get under control. So much so that the doctors don't even talk about them. Most of them don't even measure them because if you can't control them, you can't move them, they're not going to look at it. That's the typical rule. Other inflammation markers, C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, the only marker that's FDA approved to identify if a stroke is going to happen in a patient. PLI2, a nasty inflammatory chemical, actually will strip the myelin right off the nerves like you find in MS. Myeloperoxidase, which can hurt plaque. Uric acid, most of the time people talk about it with gout, but it has a lot of functions with pituitary gland and a whole host of other things with protein digestion. Free fatty acids, the good fats, the bad fats, the omega-3, omega-6 conversations. Homocysteine, a majorly inflammatory chemical that does affect the brain, causes Parkinson's, and well, is involved in Parkinson's and all those different neurodegenerative processes, but it's definitely involved in autoimmunities. So if we all agree as a medical profession and doctors amongst ourselves that chronic inflammation is involved in pretty much all of these neurodegenerative, autoimmune, chronic diseases, if you will, how many of these are typically measured on blood work? Pretty much none. I mean, you may know high sensitive to C-reactive protein because that got a lot of publicity a bunch of years ago because it relates to cardiovascular disease. Maybe they measure that one, but I'm pretty sure that they're not correlating it back to the fact that this is part of what goes on with an autoimmune. These are really important things. The lower these numbers are, the less damage your body is taking. And that's always our first step. And when I ask me, where do you start? Well, I always start at the beginning. The first thing is to get somebody out of danger. The faster you get down the inflammatory chemicals that are going to damage their body, the faster the person will, will start to lessen that damage that they're taking. Because remember, the second you have an autoimmune, your body is taking damage. That's why I freak out. That's why I get so passionate about this, because every second that that's happening, your tissue is damaging underneath the surface, even if you don't feel that it's happening. Okay? Again, it's just like termites eating the wood route right from underneath, and when you take down the drywall, all the wood's destroyed and rotted out and gone. Holy cow moment, but this has been happening over the course of a length of period of time. So if we're agreeing that all of these markers are there, the first thing that we have, and causing that, the first thing we have to do is get those markers down. Because then that buys us what becomes our friend is time. If you're not taking damage, now we have time to work and get somebody better and restore function and normalize gut and heal the tissues and things like that. If they're constantly taking damage, the body's always under stress and strain. 
Acid versus alkaline, huge conversation in this. You probably heard a lot about this pH and things like that. Most of the time you find these cases to be very acidic. You have to do first morning urine to get the best idea. But the reality of it is, is you will not heal if you're in an acidic state. And I'm not talking about necessarily your stomach at this point, I'm talking about your blood system. Your body will buffer the blood system to make sure that it stays within a certain range for pH, otherwise it won't be able to even survive, let alone not have chronic disease. So this is a really important factor that you have to make sure that you handle. The more acidic the environment, the more stuck somebody is in, with chemical toxins or infections in their system. We get people that come in all the time and say, well, you know, I, I went to a seminar, I read this book, and I said, eat, eat alkaline, I'm doing that, my, my, you know, it doesn't really change. It goes up, as soon as I kind of start doing that, it goes crashing right back down. They still got something in their system that's creating that acidic environment. Again, usually a chemical toxin or an infection somewhere. So, traditional labs, let's talk about them because that's where we start. Do heavy metals show up? Do low level infections show up? Does leaky gut show up on traditional labs? Do they bother to measure any of those inflammation markers that we talked about except maybe that one? Do toxic estrogen show up? Do food sensitivities show up? The answer is no. Pretty much all of the standard labs that will run, the doctors will run, will not show any of those details or problems. They may get one that says, oh, look, you have this issue. But there's no details of how it's happening or, even more importantly, why it's happening. Because, again, they're, they're not concerned in the how it's happening and the why it's happening because they're not going to do anything about that. They're going to suppress, oh, that it is happening. And, you, and again, fine for short term, no issue there. Problem is, if you don't know the ideas of how it's happening and how it's working, how are you ever going to have the conversation of stopping that? Well, you're not. You may at best slow down the problem or create a different problem elsewhere that may not even get linked together that they were coming together. So the key is da, 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 proper lab testing. I know it's not shocking stuff, but I mean, it, if you test those things, the causation markers, what's doing damage, those, all those individual things, I and mean, when we do labs, they're involved. But the details, Okay, hopefully you've gotten that point this way. If you get the details, then you're going to know where this goes. Okay. So we look at inflammatory markers. We look at gut health markers. We look at hormone health markers. Toxic estrogens don't always show up on those unless you're asking for them. We look for food sensitivity markers. We measure 96 different foods. How nice is it to know, should I eat this or should I not eat this? Well, you can do elimination diets and process of elimination, which takes a ton of time, takes a lot of effort, and it's really difficult, versus... Here's what you don't eat, here's what you can eat sometimes in moderation, and here's where you live, and this is what you eat consistently. That takes out an awful lot of guesswork. I don't like guesswork. Immune system markers, where, what balance are we in? Are we out of balance? Is there something active driving your immune system? Can your immune system shut back off? Infection marker, markers, toxic markers, detoxification markers, this is what we need to know. Okay. So many times I'll have somebody bring me in a CBC and certain markers will be high, certain parts of their immune system will be elevated or low, and the standard thing that I hear that they, were, that they tell me that the doctors told them was, some people are just like that. Okay, some people are just like that, but there's a reason. There's something in their system that's causing them to be like that. If you don't take the time and effort to look, then that's a pretty good fail-safe line to use, but it's kind of a cop-out, truthfully. Oh, and this whole thing of age, total cop-out. I sat with somebody the other day who told me that, that she was sick because she's just getting older because she just turned 30. I don't know what that means for me because I'm way past that, so hopefully that's not something we told. Age is not a disease. Sure, you have more time to accumulate more of these problems, but it doesn't mean that this is absolutely going to have to be. So if, if you just, we're just blaming it on age, again, kind of falls into a, a wastebasket type of diagnosis thing. Okay, so... The oversimplified version of how you go after this. You get out what shouldn't be there, that's causing the confusion and the chaos in the first place. You restore the balance to the systems, and then you make sure that they have the protective mechanisms. They can detoxify, they can digest, and all those different things, so that it doesn't happen again. I know it sounds kind of overly simplistic, and maybe it is, but we'll get into a little more depth here. But these things are really breaks down to what you have to do in order to make this happen. At the very best, what you're getting is somewhere down here, they're just suppressing all of this so that, you know, it doesn't get as bad as possible as quickly, maybe. Okay, first things first, talked about this earlier, stop the damage. Get all of that inflammation down really, really quickly. So we talked about cytokines, okay, before, and this is just a chart. One of the technologies that we use in our clinic is called microcurrent. Microcurrent's a really powerful technology, and what has been proven time and time again to do in research is lower inflammation markers. Okay, so 
just to give you a quick idea, so here's interleukin-1 went from 392 to 21.4, under 25 is normal. Interleukin-6 from 204 to 15. Interleukin-8 from 59 to 4. Tumor necrosis alpha to 299 to 20. Okay. Substance P, which causes pain, the P stands for pain, from 132 to 10. Do you think people get pain relief with that? They do. Your endorphin levels, which are typically, again, you're not creating a lot of endorphins, from 5 to 88. It's going to help. Lupus is a very painful condition, probably one of the top three pain conditions that are out there. They all have variations of this somehow. You do these things, not only do they get better, but they feel better right away too. I don't want you to suffer. First, I want to stop the damage, but involved in that is getting you feeling better. It's a heck of a lot easier to get better when you're feeling okay. Huge steps. All right, makes me the bad guy in the room to talk about the diet is important. You can't just go out on a free-for-all and do these things. But we can give you the absolute guidelines of what you need to do and how you need to do it. Eliminate the obvious stuff. People always ask me, what can I do? What can I start right now? Well, we'll eliminate the obvious stuff. Get the processed foods out. Get the sugars out. They're going to be bad. Make sure you're well hydrated. Drink water. I know there's other things that taste better out there, but literally water, there's no process in your body that does not require water. It's like gasoline for a car. You need water, proper hydration in your system, especially if you're with us in Las Vegas, Nevada area. It's hot here. It's a desert. you got to drink a little extra water. Gluten, okay, the whole gluten controversy. If you're sensitive to gluten, which, again, statistically 46% of Americans are, you need to get gluten out of your diet. Now, there may be a situation where you don't have to get gluten out of your diet, but we will see. That's how you do this with testing. So, should I eat gluten? Should I not eat gluten? You see this on all of the talk shows and all the conversations on the internet. The reality of it is, is for 46% of the people, gluten's a no-no. Same thing with soy. Actually, of all of these things, cow's dairy, statistically, 60% of Americans are allergic to cow's dairy. So that starts the process. So that's actually the most common one. So again, start getting some of these guys out of your diet. Now, I get so many patients who come in and say, I'm a doctor, I eliminate all these things. Why do I still have a normal immunity? You know, for a small percentage of the population, maybe 5, 10%, just getting that stuff out makes all the difference. Start there. That's great. And if it works for you, amazing. So happy that you were in that 5, 10%. For the rest of the boat people out there who have these issues, this is just the baseline. This is what you have to do in order to be able to move forward. It's not going to solve the issue. If you're one of those 10%, great. If not, you're still doing it, but there's a lot of other steps that have to be taken. Again, whatever you're sensitive to, whether it's asparagus or whatever it will be, you've got to get that out of the diet, otherwise it's going to consistently inflame you and we're going to lose ground. Nobody expects you to be perfect with diet. The better you are with it, the faster you move forward. That's the bottom line. Okay, so now, step by step, find out whatever else is in the system that's causing your immune system to overreact and become confused. Now, I will tell you, you can do labs on some of this stuff. You can do urinalysis for heavy metals and things like that. But one thing that we do use is kinesiology. I do use a lot of muscle testing because otherwise, you know, there's thousands of infections. There's probably thousands of infections that we don't even know about yet. But the reality so it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And while kinesiology, which is a form of muscle testing, is by no way 100% or anything along those lines, it allows me to check as many things as fast as I can in as much depth as I can in the least invasive way. I'm not going to draw blood on you every time you walk in here. That's crazy. It allows me. I will personally do everything in my power. I will take every bit of information to help me fit this jigsaw puzzle together. That is one thing that helps me. People say, well, I don't, I don't believe in it. Okay, that, that's fine. I've done this with it and I've done it without it. It always works better with it. It's just something that we use on a day-to-day -day basis so that we can make this as specific and individualized for you as we possibly can when we're trying to identify these things. Okay, begin the detoxification process. What has to happen in the front end of that is you have to make sure that your body is going to be able to handle it. Can your liver handle it? Can your kidneys handle it? One of the things we look for in labs is making sure that your body will be able to handle that push that we're going to make it do. Okay. So, again, more technology that we use to cheat move things along. How do I do these things in the timelines that we typically do them in? Well, we have technology that can get inflammation down super fast. We have ionic detox units, which are great for pulling out inflammation from the body, but anything that's metabolic waste that gets into the bloodstream can get pulled out of the body without having to go through your liver and kidney pathways. Same thing with infrared sauna. It will pull it off through your skin. So that way we can use that to take the burden off. 
understand that your liver and your kidneys are the limiting factor. We can only go as fast as those guys can detoxify. The more we can get out without them, the faster this goes, the better you get, the healthier you feel, all of those things. We use frequency generators to help neutralize toxins and infections in the system as quickly as possible, again, so that we have time to work. One of these concepts that we'll talk about a lot is neutralizing. If you neutralize the effect, remember, it's not that you have an infection, it's not that you, you, know, you didn't have that bacteria one second and the next second it was there, or that chemical hasn't been in your mouth for years, now all of a sudden you react to it. There's this idea that your, it's your reaction is what makes you sick. Our body finally says, what is that? We need to do something about this now. Maybe the level is too high or it's been there for too long, whatever the case may be. Lots of times this is where people come under stress. You know, emotions do play a role in this. They come under stress and everything goes bad. That's that final straw that breaks the camel's back. Remember, if we calm your reaction to that down, you'll feel better, the damage stops, and then we have time to work. It's a huge concept in the neutralizing world of natural health care, but it is an important one when it comes to getting results. Okay, we use homeopathy. It allows me to support organs specifically, and specifically for specific people in specific ways. It also allows us to evaluate and attract and attack specific toxins in your system to get them neutralized and to get them out as safely and gently as possible and as quickly as possible too. So I do use a lot of homeopathy in the clinic along with nutritional supplements. We always want to support brain function and you know we go way more into this in the, in the neurological based videos but the reality of it is this and it's a simple, you probably heard the expression before, is where the brain goes the body follows. So if we have a healthy brain, the body is going to be pretty healthy. If you have an unhealthy body, you're going to end up with an unhealthy brain. They always go together. Those chronic level of inflammations, you saw all the ones I was pointing out, those interleukin ones and, and, and all of those guys that are involved in autoimmune diseases, they were all involved in neurodegenerative disorders as well too. That means they affect the brain. But even simple things, sugar levels that aren't appropriate, blood sugar levels, I'm not talking even necessarily about diabetes, but sugar handling that's not appropriate, anemias, things that iron levels that are inappropriate, you know, the iron ore that we talked about. If those things are wrong, you're not going to get oxygen to your brain, you're not going to get stimulation to your brain. Your body's not going to heal this fast. So we're always making sure we're taking oxygen contests. Activation, fuel, and oxygen. Do you ever see where people talk about, you know, do crossword puzzles as you get older so it keeps your brain firing? That's why, because activation is important, but you need sugar, you need glucose, you need fuel to be able to do that. And so many times, again, with our diets, we typically find that people are really sugar heavy. And then that's going to screw up the way that the body handles it and uses it for brain function. Again, we've got to make sure the oxygen levels are appropriate. And again, this is where emotions play. Okay, because a lot of times, we're just talking about things like brain waves. And there's a certain brain wave where the body goes into what we'll call fight or flight. You maybe heard of the term. Fight or flight, no healing occurs in fight or flight. Your body's just in crisis management. So if we can change those brain waves out of fight or flight, the body has a better chance of healing faster. Again, we're just, what I always talk about is stacking the deck, hitting this on as many levels in the right order, and that's different for everybody, but hitting it in the right order that will put all of the things in our favor so now we're no longer behind the eight ball, but we're moving forward and putting everything in our specific places. Now, supporting epigenetics. Earlier we talked about the MTHFR genetic, which can be up to 70% make a person not able to utilize B vitamins. It's a simple nutritional change. They need a specific type of B vitamin and then their body will use it no problem. But if you don't handle somebody or you don't evaluate them on a genetic level, there are certain genetics like we said, they can't detoxify. So you can push them to detoxify and, and they won't do it or they'll make themselves worse. But if you, you handle that, there are simple nutritional fixes to this, but if you don't do it, you never level the playing field, and you're starting behind the eight ball. We don't want to be there. Certainly, we want to rebuild the gut. Simple. Get out all again, all the bad stuff out, rebound up everything else so nothing's leaking, and re-inoculate it with the good stuff. A, a simple enough process, but it involves se separate pieces of rebuilding the whole system. You do that right, you get 80% regulation of your immune system. It's an important one when it comes to autoimmune. Of course, now we want to balance out the two sides of the immune system. Sometimes people do simple things and they don't mean to, and it actually screws them up. Green tea, which is a really popular drink, is actually a pretty involved Th2 stimulant. So if somebody has a Th2 dominant immune disease and they're drinking lots of green tea, they're going to make that significantly worse. Again, unfortunately, it gets complicated, but this is why we guide people through this step by step because we don't expect you to know this. Look, when I take my taxes, to my accountant, 
I don't know what can write off. I trust him as the expert in order to do that. So sad in medical nowadays that you have to go in and be your own advocate. Well, I read this on Google or I saw this or I, you know, I heard that. That's supposed to be my job. And that's what we walk people through step by step of how to do it. We want to restore the protective balance of the body. We want to restore proper enzyme function. Nobody talks about enzymes. We talk about nutrition. Oh, you got to give them antioxidants. You have to give them this. You have to give them that. And that's all well and good. But the reality of it is, is you need enzymes to work every single process inside of your body. And that enzymes come from protein. And you need proper protein digestion. But if you don't have right acid, you'll never get proper protein digestion. And up until the point that you do, again, protein digestion becomes a limiting factor of how many enzymes you can make. So you want to restore the body's ability to break down proteins and get those enzymes into the system right away. Same conversation. You can take digestive enzymes for the rest of your life. Is that a better option than maybe doing drugs and things like that? Sure, probably. But if we can restore the body's ability of using protein to make those enzymes, now you don't have to take them forever. That's a best option. Good, better, best. We always operate on best. Okay, so why this type of care? Okay, chronic conditions versus acute conditions. And I say this with all due respect because I have a lot of respect for medical personnel out there who's doing the work. But truthfully, they are amazing at acute conditions. You're in a heart attack, you go in, they can do life-saving procedures to save your world. And that is an amazing thing. It's not something that I do. And I have ultimate respect for them for doing that. But when we take those kind of methods and we try to put it into a chronic disease mindset, it fails miserably. And it's been failing miserably for years and it's probably why you're watching this video. So the reality of it is, is chronic disease using you know, a medical approach is lost in a lost world. They don't even know what they don't know as far as dealing with all these things. So you can't go in there expecting a result. Now again, not really their fault because it's not what they were designed to do. They handle acute things. They're kind of making do with what they can with, to, to handle a, a chronic problems with acute methodology. It just doesn't work. So they're doing the best that they can for you. It's not that they're out there maliciously doing it, but it's in pharmaceutically driven healthcare. Again, how do I get the results? Well, I can step outside of that box. I don't just prescribe everybody who comes in the same medications that they, you know, they've always been on or that everybody else does. Pretty much every autoimmune goes on prednisone or methotrexate or something like that. They're just all immune suppressives. You have to strip this all down in a pharmaceutically driven world. Again, we've kind of proven that that model has failed for chronic disease. It helps in the short term, but it's not a long-term solution. It was never meant to be a long-term solution, but without any other solutions, you know, we had to do something. Well, now, hopefully, by the end of this video, you'll understand what the other solutions actually are. You know, again, if we accept your case, then we totally believe that we can get you better. I, I don't accept everybody, and that's just not something I say as a pitch or whatever. I really have to believe that we will get it better and that there's things that are going on, otherwise we may recruit other doctors. And I'm not just going to leave you out in the lurch, but I'm going to refer you to where I think is appropriate. But if we take on the case, you know, we're doing this for 10 years, the track record is there, you know, the, these cases resolve, they get better. If you, know, if you can't get it completely gone, you're in remission and the person has a happy, healthy, normal life forever. So if this is something that we're working with. We're going to get results, but we're going to do it to the level that we just talked about. We expect you to kind of meet us halfway there. Sometimes I don't take cases just because people will just not refuse to change what they eat. I, I can't control that. You know, but please, pretty please, with sugar on top, don't choose dairy over your health. Don't choose dairy over cancer. Okay, I know when you lay it out that way it sounds ridiculous, but actually it's what it kind of comes down to it. When these problems get bad enough, people will deal with what they have to do. This does not have to be a death sentence. This does not mean that you, if you have this problem that you can't have a healthy life. Yeah, you have a lot of work to do set out in front of you, which we just went over all that stuff over all this time. But you have to take control, but you can. The entire purpose of this video w was to give you back control. Because so many people, when I see it, they don't know what to do. They don't even know what's wrong with them. They don't know where to go. They don't know what the option is. You are in control. You can take care of this if you want to. No more of this. I have lots of people who come in and say, well, you know, my doctor said there's nothing I can do about it. Frankly, that's his opinion or her opinion. Don't stay sick because of somebody else's opinion. My opinion is different than that. But you have to be open to other ideas and other methodology in order to do that. But in that world, yeah, I kind of agree. You're not going to get it better with drugs. So that's their opinion, but it, what they're using is right. But don't stay sick because of what somebody else's opinion is. And again, I have patients come in. I'm with the best doctor in town. I'm not saying he's not. I'm not saying that they're not a nice person. I'm not saying that they're maliciously trying to hurt you. This comes down to results. 
plain and simple. I don't care how you get them. I just want you to get them. And at that point, you ask yourself, well, I take the best, I take all these supplements and I do this. Are you getting the result that you want? If the answer to that is no, we have to look someplace else. Einstein said the definition of insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. This comes down to results. If you're not getting results, which I'm assuming you're not if you're watching this whole video, then there's something else that you have to do or maybe fill in a gap someplace else. Okay? I used to have a professor that would say this. He, one day I was sitting with him outside of class and I said, hey, you know, you know what they say, knowledge is power. And he told me, no, knowledge is not power. Knowledge is neutral. He's like, it's the application of knowledge that makes it powerful. It's like, Rob, you can be the smartest guy in the world, but if you sit on that bar stool and you never open your mouth, he's like, nobody will ever know it and you'll never change anything. And he's right. At the end of the day, like I said, it's not going to do anything if you don't take action and you don't take massive action. That's the whole purpose, again, the video is to give you the information so now you know what the steps are. And that's great. That's the purpose of all of this stuff. Okay, so, little housework. Our rules for working together, because like I said, I, if I accept the case, but I got to accept the case on some things that you expect to do. We expect you to make lifestyle changes. I expect you to change the diet. We'll help you. I can't come home and cook for you. You probably don't want me to. Maybe you want my wife to come home and do that for you. But we expect you to make those changes because you've got to be involved in doing this as well. We can do what we do here, but if you're not doing the stuff outside that will keep this going, it's only going to go so far. Bottom line is, insurance won't pay for everything. Now, welcome to this world. I mean, this is, this is the world with Obamacare now. It's just not going to be. Now, the good news is, most of the time, pretty much almost all the time, we can get the insurance companies to pay for the labs, which sadly is the most expensive part of this whole thing. I say sadly because not that they're not important to figuring out what's going on, it's the first step. But having lab work, and usually patients bring me binders full of lab work, what they already had done, lab work doesn't get you better. It's kind of back to the knowledge is power thing. Yeah, we know what's going on, but if you don't do anything about it, or you just suppress the system, it's not going to get you better. So if you're one of those people who you know, believe that insurance should cover everything, or you need insurance to cover everything, this is probably not going to work for you. You know, we can, but we can get you budget. We can get, we will work within your means. We will do what we need to do in order to get you well if that's truly something you want. But if you can't put on a minimum about 250 bucks a month, you know, nutrition and, and health stuff towards your health, again, this is probably not going to work for you. And, and the truth be told is, it's either not enough value or you didn't get all the stuff that we just spent all this last bit of time talking about. You didn't get the importance of that. Or the saddest part about it is, problems not just bad, just just not bad enough yet. You know, now I encourage you, don't wait till it's bad enough, because if the cost is the big thing then, it's going to be only worse when things get longer. But truth be told, if it's not bad enough, people won't move. Don't wait till rock bottom. You know, that's your choice. I have no saying that one way versus the other. You tell me when you're ready. But most people, if that's the case, they didn't understand how important this was, or they're just not thinking long term, or it's just, it's just sadly not bad enough yet, and we just don't want you to be there. Okay? If we work together with people who have nowhere else to go, if you want some more information about this, that's great. We have a website. There's a lot of information on the website that you're free to go look at. But then don't take time to come on in because we're working with people who are going to move and get better. There's only a limited amount of all the technology that we have that we can apply for each different person each time they come towards. You know, here's what I encourage. I encourage because I hear this all the time. Dr. D, I'd love to become a patient, but the money is the issue. Get a piece of paper, split it down the middle, and on one side write the pros and the other side write the cons. Why would you want this problem solved? Well, I'd feel better. I'd sleep better. I, you know, could go to work more. I would enjoy my family more. I would enjoy my weekends more, my free time. Maybe I wouldn't fall asleep right when I come home from work or be miserable, you know, when, when that happens. Wh whatever the case may be. For the majority of people, the one thing that ends up on the other side is money. We'll budget you where you can. Sometimes, you know, people can finance things. You know, lots of our patients finance it. You know, you can finance important things. If your car breaks down, maybe you can't go out and lay out cash. Maybe if your fridge breaks down, you can't lay out cash. If your kid needs braces, most people can't lay out eight grand for braces. You finance important things, and that can be done. Make that list, and when you see the balance of one side versus it, it just comes down if there's enough value for you to do it to get better. I will help you when you're ready for that. Okay? Here's the questions I always like. One of my friends always asks these questions. How has your problems affected your, your relationship, your finances, your work, your activities? What does it cost you in time, money, sleep, happiness? Where does this go in five years? This doesn't stop. Autoimmune doesn't go away. It's just going to progressively get worse and worse and worse and worse. And this mentality of I'll deal with it later, 
where is it going to be in five years? It's certainly not going to be easier to fix. It's certainly not going to be less expensive to fix and maybe even more involved. Where does it go? And what's it worth? I mean, again, you know, this is the biggest thing. There is no greater investment out there than investing in yourself. And you could have all the cliches in the world, you know, you know, you can't put a price on your health, but unfortunately that's exactly what you have to do. You have to decide what's worth. Please, Mr. and Mr. this has nothing to do with me convincing you. I want you to get well. That's the purpose of this video. I can't make you do it, and, and truth be told, I'm not going to force you to do it. I don't want to work with somebody who I have to force through the process. It's hard enough to get all of these things resolved if you've got a person who's fully on board and ready to make changes. When that time comes is the time when we work. So when you're ready for that kind of commitment, we're here to help you. If you want more information, please go to the website, www.shslasvegas.com. The SHS is for Superior Health Solutions. If you're ready, call. if you're not sure, call the office. Talk with one of the patient advocates. They will get ideas for what's going on, give you ideas of where you are. When you're ready to move with this, take that step to get yourself better. And I hope that you do, and I hope that I hear from you.